are back. This is episode number 66 of Calibrated with Scott. I'm Scott, of course. I've been a little absent. I've been extremely busy lately, so I do apologize to all of you guys. I did get an episode up on the Patreon recently, so if you uh, are interested in watching that episode, you can go and uh, join my Patreon. Uh, If you are somebody who supports my work and you want me to keep doing this, I would like to start doing this full time. Uh, that is the easiest way now that you can support me. Obviously, watching my videos on YouTube are, uh, is a great help, but uh, the Patreon is an area where I'm going to be posting exclusive content. Uh, not as much important content like these uh, updates are, but uh, you know, fun interviews and conversations that I have with people that are also in this information space. So the first video is up there. I'll be probably doing two or three videos a month on my Patreon. Uh, but any of the big interviews like Brian Berletic or anybody else for that matter will likely be going up on the YouTube and all of my situation and reports on the Ukraine uh, conflict will be going up here. So without further ado, uh, let's just get right into it. Uh, we have a lot of updates today. We have about nine days worth of stuff to talk about. So uh, this video might go a little long, but we're going to get through it and we're going to cover as much as we possibly can. Uh, I'm going to start with the counteroffensive updates uh, around Bakhmut. Uh, the Ukrainians have really slowed down. Uh, Klitschivka is still basically entirely gray zone. The Ukrainians can go into the town, but they get hit when they're in there. Uh, the Ukrainians are making slight progresses here and there, but nothing really of any um, substantial, uh, no, any, nothing to take notice of really in this area. Uh, the Russian offensive up in the north, uh, you know, if you call it an offensive, there hasn't been a very large commitment in this area. Uh, a lot of sort of gray zone has been captured. Some Ukrainian strong points have been captured, but there's not been a large force commitment in this area yet, uh, like I was expecting there to be. Um, I think it would be uh, appropriate for the Russians to do that right now. Uh, maybe they have already accomplished their goals by forcing Ukraine to rotate troops up to this area. Um, but in the LPR and in the Kharkov region, uh, the lines are pretty stable for the for the time being. Uh, down in the south, <clears throat> the lines are also uh, pretty stable. Uh, the Ukrainians, since my last video, have actually had geolocated proof that infantry has crossed one of the lines of defense. Uh, that would be the anti-tank ditch, the dragon's teeth, and the uh, fortified lines. So we we do have confirmation that Ukrainian infantry has crossed uh, this uh, territory uh, near Vorobe. Uh, however, uh, it's important to uh, notice that there are no vehicles in support of this. So most of this is just deep reconnaissance groups or DRGs uh, that are uh, penetrating this line and, you know, ending up getting hit by artillery and AGS fire, which AGS is just a grenade launcher machine gun, basically. Uh, it shoots 40 mic and uh, 40 millimeter grenade launchers uh, or gr- grenades, sorry. Um, so we have the only evidence we have of the Ukrainians crossing the line is uh, casualties, uh, wounded in action and killed in action, uh, and no vehicles uh, to this point. So there was a lot of talk over this last week of some sort of breakthrough. You know, they've made it through the first line. The next lines are going to be easier. In fact, they haven't really made it through the first line. They're still trying to overcome the first line. This is where all the fighting is going on. Uh, infantry has been able to get through in some areas, but the infantry that gets through is end up, is ending up being targeted by artillery and, uh, you know, other uh, arms are hitting them. So no no real significant progress here. And for the, the direction that the Ukrainians are going, I'll put up a map here, towards Vorobe is really uh, not the direction they want to be going the the main thrust of the ukrainian offensive was supposed to penetrate through uh robitny and head south towards melitopol uh right now they're being sort of uh pushed along this low ground where they're able to make progress because the russians aren't willing to hold this uh valley territory and the ukrainians are just continuing to push down this valley where they're getting uh hit on all sides so the uh, Ukrainian counteroffensive has continued to not uh, make any progress. Since the, my last video, there have been no major updates. Uh, Robitny is still 50-50 in the gray zone. Uh, I'm sorry, not 50-50. Uh, one-fourth, the southern one-fourth is still in the gray zone. I don't think the Russians occupy any positions in the city itself or in the village itself. 
uh, but the Ukrainians can't actually control the whole of the village. So this has been a thorn in their side the entire time. They really would like to secure this, but it just hasn't been working out. Um, <clears throat> and the Russians continue to attrit uh, some of the best brigades of the Ukrainian armed forces, the NATO standard brigades, uh, the 46th uh, and the 82nd mechanized brigades have both been committed. Uh, these are now being heavily committed uh, and the attrition on these brigades is starting to rise. I mean, it's, it's becoming substantial. And if you guys remember, uh, these brigades are not actually full uh, manned brigades of four to five thousand. They're closer to two to three thousand. So uh, attrition on these brigades is actually going to be more substantial uh, with less losses. Um, so if you lose 100 guys, you know, that's a larger percentage of your entire brigade than if you were to lose 100 guys, you know, when you have a total of five thousand. So things are not going the way that the Ukrainians had hoped. Uh, and I had actually recorded a video before this video, and the whole time in that video, I was talking about uh, where well, where are these challengers, uh, the challenger tanks? We haven't seen them brought into action. I hadn't mentioned that it may have mean that the uh, 82nd hadn't been fully committed yet, uh, and that there was they were still sort of like probing before a large major attack. Um, and right after I recorded that video, uh, I hopped on Telegram uh, to start gathering my uh, photos and stuff that I edited into the video, and I saw a Challenger uh, burning. So I uh, scrapped that video because that was a good portion of my last video, and uh, I'm here redoing it. Uh, and here is that Challenger video. Uh, as you can see, it's been uh, pretty clearly stated that this is a Challenger. You can see by the dimensions of the vehicle. Uh, and Western sources have confirmed this. So the Ukrainians have lost one of their 14 challengers confirmed. There are rumors that a second challenger has been destroyed, but those are just rumors so, uh, so far until we actually see proof of that. Uh, so, you know, 7% of the Ukrainian challenger fleet is now gone. Um, we saw a lot of cope around this. I'll put up, I'll put up some cope right here uh, so you guys can laugh at that. A lot of uh, survivability. Uh, my one of my uh, favorite people to make fun of in the information space, uh, Laser Pig, came on and uh, basically was making the claim that the Challenger had a mechanical issue. The crew ended up jumping out of it and dropping a Molotov down in there to uh, prevent it from being captured, uh, which is hilarious because, well, for the for for, for the first uh, part of this, we have to figure out where this tank was, and it was geolocated to the north of Rabitny. So coming into the settlement of Rabitny, where the Ukrainians have full control, uh, the uh, claim is that they burned it down so that it wasn't captured, which is just nonsense. Uh, a few hours later, we ended up getting footage of uh, the tank getting hit by, I believe, an ATGM or a artillery round. I, I can't remember. Uh, but the Challenger is gone. Uh, people are saying that the crew survived. I mean, there's no way of knowing. You're never going to know if that crew survived. And it's just, it's just, a, it's just cope again. Remember, this is the first Challenger tank that has been lost in combat. That was the Challenger's whole uh, prowess was that it has never suffered a casualty in combat other than one uh, friendly fire incident. And in, I think like 2004 or something like that. Uh, so uh, the first challenger lo lost to the Russians, which is just a very, very interesting uh, way of looking at this weapon system. It's something that I don't think anybody who is designing the challenger would have ever thought it would be used for uh, and lost to the Russians. So that's uh, it's, it's, it's just something interesting, something kind of cool, something historic that happened over this last week. Um, but the Ukrainians are still insistent on pushing. So negating the losses uh they are continuing on this offensive that is clear to almost anybody who's looking at it objectively has failed uh <clears throat> and why they're pushing uh propaganda purposes you know who who knows at this point because strategically this doesn't make any sense they're they're burning through uh qualified reserves in an area where they're not making any progress and they're not they don't have enough uh force behind any of these reserves uh remaining you know any remaining reserves to actually exploit any breakthrough that is created so the uh 
the, the slog continues, the losses continue to mount, and I don't think the Russians mind. Uh, why uh, go on the offensive when the enemy is running at you in your prepared fire bags and in your defensive positions? Uh, the Russian uh, FPV menace continues. Uh, if anybody doesn't know, FPV is like a, it's a small drone uh, system that both sides have been using. Uh, first person view, so you wear like little goggles and you fly it around. And uh, these have RPGs attached to them. In one of my previous videos, I showed a little montage of this. Uh, this has not abated at all. In fact, it's gotten worse. These drones are everywhere. Uh, they're only targeting infantry at this point uh, because the uh, Ukrainians have really stopped putting in a lot of vehicles into these assaults. It's a lot of infantry, uh, which has been, I think, more successful for them. But obviously, the uh, casualties are a lot higher. So uh, the FPV uh, menace is more prevalent than ever. Uh, this is a very, very, very big deal. And uh, it's it's a... Uh, it's something that's really changing the battlefield. I think in the next couple of years, you're going to see a large emphasis on somebody in a squad or unit uh, carrying a uh, electronic warfare device in a backpack. Somebody is going to be uh, specifically trained and uh, um, specifically trained and equipped with this sort of backpack system that prevents drones from watching over a unit uh, from anywhere uh, close. Obviously not bigger surveillance drones that are higher up in the air, but these small quadricopter drones that can either surveil you and call in artillery or uh, have a you know RPG attached to them and fly into you and do some serious damage. So the FPV menace is always going to be there. Um, and the Ukrainians are really up against the clock right now. Uh, if, if it, you know, we've talked about this before, the muddy season is on the way, uh, Washington DC, uh, has come out there, you know, uh, unnamed sources in the white house or in the Pentagon, uh, one of the two have come out and said that, uh, Ukraine has about six to seven weeks before their offensive culminates, uh, which I think is very accurate. Uh, they have that much time before, the uh, ground conditions become horrible. The mud and the rainy season starts. And then in Zaporozhye, you know, you're going to be restricted to two roads and you just can't fight on two roads. So uh, they're on the clock. I think that's why they're pushing really hard right now, but they're just not achieving what they need to achieve. And uh, morale is going to take a serious hit if this doesn't end up working out. Um, We've actually got some uh, equipment updates. Uh, I mean, in terms of like uh, advances in the Russian uh, military space, uh, we have the first confirmed use of a Fab 1500, which is a huge bomb uh, with a guidance kit system. Uh, the Russians were struggling to make the, a bomb of this size work with the guidance kit. Apparently now <clears throat> they've solved those issues the guidance kits for these weapons are going into mass production, and this is just going to significantly increase the uh, losses of the Ukrainian armed forces through deep strikes. Uh, anytime you're advancing, you have the chance of having something uh, with an 800 to 1,000 uh, kiloton warhead. Uh, I'm sorry, not kiloton. Uh, uh, kg, kilogram, uh, explosive warhead coming down on top of you. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just not, it's not a good time. So this is another advance for the Russian aviation, uh, and their usefulness will further increase. Uh, we've seen an increase in fab usage, just in general guided bomb usage, uh, fab two fifties, fab five hundreds have been fall falling nonstop on Ukrainian positions in the Zaporozhye area. They're talking about 50 to hundred being used a day over the entire SMO area, uh, 100 to 200 being used a day so there's a lot of bombs dropping all over the place and it's uh co it's causing significant significant damage i did a, i made a post about this where i talked about if only 10 percent of the bombs are actually doing damage because sometimes they do have uh, some slight accuracy issues um that's still five to seven mass casualty or equipment losses a day that you're dealing with right hqs being hit ammo supply being hit you're, it's just another attrition, another strain on the Ukrainian system right now. And uh, I, I think it's significant enough that it's being uh, noticed. Um, we also have some updates. Uh, the West is now 
confident that they are going to be sending a TACMS, uh, which is a long range ballistic missile to Ukraine fired out of uh, HIMARS or a M270 uh, missile launcher, which are the, like the same thing. One is tracked, one is wheeled. Um, and this system is a red line for Russia. So this is another escalation by the West. Uh, the Russians will probably do nothing as they've done all the rest of the uh, escalations, or they do some sort of horizontal escalating uh, somewhere else in the world. But in terms of direct escalation from the Russians in the SMO and a direct response, I don't know if we'll see it. Um, I've kind of given up on that line of thinking. Russian red lines seem to be pretty uh, loose, and they are willing to take uh, embarrassments and stuff like this on the chin in, uh, to negate, I don't know what their thinking is. See, this is, this is where my, I start to come into conflict with the Russian MOD and how they operate. Um, if I'm putting a red line in the sand, I'm making it a red line and I'm going to stand by that. But I'm also not in a position of power where I'm dealing with the lives of, you know, hundreds of thousands of men and potentially putting my country on the brink of a war. You know, escalation always has comp uh, consequences. It's always a double-edged sword. So, you know, I'm not there. I don't have all the intel. And I'm just giving my uh, unqualified opinion, I guess, on that. Um, but that's pretty much it for the counteroffensive. Uh, we really haven't seen any progress still. We're coming up on day 95. So... It's it's been it's been a slog fest and it's been really rough for the Ukrainians. They're just not getting done what they need to get done. And, you know, I think that this is a result of mismanagement of force uh, usage around Bakhmut over the winter and into the spring. I think it was a result of the delay of the Ukrainian spring offensive turning into a summer offensive. The Russians have these incredibly fortified lines. Uh, that were made professionally with concrete and, uh, you know, by contractors. So they are no joke to get through. And the Ukrainians are just trying to deal with that. And it's it's impossible. They don't have the air coverage to help. They don't have the air defense to help. They are really up against it. And it's really unfortunate. Um, this is starting to show itself in multiple other ways now. Uh, the Ukrainian conscription um, contingent now there there are qualifications for somebody to get uh drafted into the Ukrainian armed forces has significantly dropped uh you're now seeing people that would not normally be allowed into the Ukrainian armed forces being allowed to join that includes people with uh, certain health conditions and health uh, exemptions for not joining the military as well as uh, people with education and career exemptions being now drafted into the Ukrainian armed forces. Uh, Ukraine is going to be running into manpower issues here very soon. They're already, uh, they've sent out uh, requests to the governments of Europe to send back uh, Ukrainian men who have fled the country. Uh, Ukrainian women are no longer allowed to leave the country. So, uh, you know, they're taking to the last Ukrainian to a whole nother level. Uh, I, I saw a post today of a man in the Sumi region who does not have a hand who just received a conscription order. Uh, I don't know what you're going to do with a one one armed man, but, uh, you know, to the last Ukrainian. It's, it's how they're going to fight it. Um, that's what the West wants. And that's what the Ukrainian regime is willing to do. So it's it's very sad, but it's it's how this is going to play out. And I think the Russians are prepared to do that. I think that negotiations are now a, a distant dream. They're never going to happen. And the only way that this is going to end is with uh, capitulation. So yeah, it's very depressing. I, I don't like that at all. Um, and I feel very bad for the people who escaped it. And now they're receiving notices in those countries. Like uh, I saw one in Ireland. I saw a couple in Poland. Uh, and it's just going to get worse and worse. They're going to start, uh, you know, um, sending these people back to Ukraine and these people are going to be sent to the front line instantly. And it's just, it's just unfortunate. Um, we did have a mass casualty event for, of civilians. I did want to go into this because I specifically covered this uh, in depth and I would like to go through some posts that I made on Twitter about this because I put together put together a very good thread on this. If you go to my Twitter, you'll see it as my tagged post um, or my pinned tweet. Uh, and 
basically what happened was there uh, was a missile that ended up striking a uh, area in uh, Konstantinovka, uh, which is in the Donbass. Uh, it is Ukrainian held, um, so they control it. It's back behind uh, Chasovyar, uh, you know, over in that direction. So it, it's in the rear, definitely. Um, and the Russians do strike this area. So when it initially happened, Zelensky posted a CCTV camera video of the strike, um, which I will post a part of it here. Um, and you can see... Uh, <laughs> And this is quite funny, uh, not that the people died, that's it's horrible, but the fact that he posted this uh, is really the only reason we have an explanation for what happened, and I go into extreme depth on how this happened. So, uh, first of all, uh, the strike killed 16 people, um, and after close examination, uh, you know, a lot of people, including myself, came to the conclusion that this missile was fired from the West. Uh, the Northwest, in fact, uh, by an aircraft likely uh, as the uh, detonation of the missile is very clearly uh, resembles a harm missile, uh, which is a anti-radiation missile uh, to destroy radars. Uh, they've had horrible, a horrible track record in Ukraine. Uh, they have failed miserably. They get shot down regularly and they don't re regularly do any damage. So these missiles uh, are underperforming and they're probably from the late 80s and they've just been in storage for 20, 30 years. So, uh, you know, we, we, we have the direction from which the missile came. Uh, we have this based on the reflection in the, in the roofs of two different cars. You can actually see the missile traveling to the site uh, where it hit before it hits. Uh, and one in the silver car and in a black car, I'll show you that video right here. Uh, it's very clear. You can see the missile. You can also watch the people's uh, attention turn towards the direction that the missile is coming from, uh, af you know, via sound. After uh, geolocations were done, we figured out that the street uh, that and the direction that the missile came from was the northwest. Um, I then uh, dug a little deeper and uh, looked at the actual explosion. Uh, I, I'll show both of the stills. Uh, these are two different explosions. One is the one that happened in Konstantinivka, and the other is a uh, harm uh, missile that uh, detonated. So, uh, it, you know, the AGM-88 harm is a uh, missile system that employs either tungsten or in the older models, steel balls. Um, and these are used to just shrapnel out an area. Probably why the casualties were so high. And <clears throat> another piece of evidence that is very clear that shows this is that there is not an actual impact. This this missile system detonates in the air and spreads uh, these you know tungsten balls or steel balls over an area. They just it, it air burst and blows down like that. So we have an air burst, which is not a Russian long range weapon system. Uh, doesn't normally do that. Uh, we have shrapnel evidence, which I'll put, put up some pictures here of, uh, you know, these tiny balls that flew out in every direction and put holes in all the metal. We also have no impact crater on the ground, which is common for Russian missile strikes. There's there's no impact crater, which means this weapon was airburst. And we have a direction which it came from. Uh, so most likely what happened is a Ukrainian plane was flying over uh Eastern Ukraine over its controlled territory, it fired this missile, uh, and for whatever reason, failure, uh, misfire, I don't know, this thing uh, flew right into a jewelry store and an open market on the road and ended up killing 16 Ukrainian civilians. Uh, it's a horrible event, but uh, it's very important to start pulling apart these propaganda claims from the Ukrainian government, uh, saying things like, oh, the Russians did it, oh, the Russians are a terrorist state. Uh, I mean, it, 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 it's a significant claim to say that Russia intentionally targeted civilians and killed 16 of them. That's a, that's a very big deal. This has not been Russia's MO this entire conflict. And I don't care what people try to tell you. The Russians have, I mean, even the most exaggerated casualty claims for Ukrainian civilians is still insanely low for a large scale a conflict of this scale in Europe uh you know over a duration of over a year and a half oh i mean it's it's longer than that now um 
the the casualties are so low. I mean, you you can look at what the U.S. did in Iraq uh, during its invasion, and that was only 44 days or so, right? Uh, A lot of civilians died, uh, and the Russians have been very, very cautious about not endangering and killing civilians to the extent that they can. Obviously, it happens. Obviously, that there are instances everywhere of uh, civilians dying when they should not have. It is horrible. Uh, And that's why we don't want wars is because civilians tend to be in the, the, you know, in the line of sight. Um, So, but you have to, you have to pull apart these claims. You can't let these things sit because then people will take them and run with them. And now Russia is a terrorist state targeting Ukrainian civilians. It's just ridiculous. It's not what happened. Uh, They lied. Uh, I'm pretty sure they know they lied. And they released the evidence that was later pulled apart and confirmed that they were lying. So that I don't blame the Ukrainians uh, for this. Uh, you know, I, I think it was probably an accident. And, you know, when you're firing weapons over uh, civilian territory, sometimes this happens. I mean, we saw this in Poland when the Ukrainian uh, air defense missile was trying to strike a Russian missile. The air defense missile overflew its target, kept going all the way into Poland and killed two farmers and hit a tractor. So this is not the first time this has happened. It won't be the last time this has happened. And it's, you know, it's nobody's fault. This is what we call collateral damage. It's an accident and uh, it's it's very unfortunate. Um, in other news, uh, we have a Russian drone incident. Uh, so the Russians have been flying uh, Garin 2 drones into Ismail. I think that's how you say it. Uh, it's uh, Southern Odessa. I'll put up a map here right on the border of Romania. Uh, and this has been uh, the topic of a lot of uh, the pro-Ukrainian inf- information space. They've been trying to distract from the Ukrainian counteroffensive. And uh, a lot of people are saying that Romania and NATO should get involved in the conflict now because Russian drone, a Russian drone has landed on the Romanian side of the border with Odessa, uh, Ukraine, and uh I mean, it landed in an open field and didn't do any damage. Uh, there could be uh, the remnants of two drones in Romania on the Romanian side of the river. I mean, you're talking less than a kilometer into Romanian territory, and they were likely shot down by Ukrainian air defense over Romanian airspace and then fell onto Romanian uh, territory. So, you know, this is just another... Uh, distraction, another way to keep attention on the conflict, make Russia look like a bad guy. Um, and, uh, it, you know, it, it might be working. Who knows? It's just, it just doesn't, it doesn't seem like the thing that, you know, NATO is going to jump on. They're not, you know, gung ho about getting involved in this at that level. They're the, Romania tried to downplay it. They say it never happened. And then a couple of days later, they say it did happen. Uh, which kind of hurts the credibility of the Romanian government. I don't know why you initially lie and then come out with the truth. The Russian government does it too, and the Ukrainian government does it as well. So uh, I think it's more of a play it safe until you have the information and then release the information as you get it. But it doesn't make a ton of sense to me. Um, So that's that's the situation over there. Uh, these strikes are so close to the Romanian border because the Ukrainians are getting a lot of uh, fuel through this port, uh, through Romania. This is a large transport hub for weapons and, and so on. And they're also moving grain through this, which the Russians are not allowing via the expired grain deal. So, uh, you know, this will continue. I don't think this is going to stop and I don't think it's going to escalate into anything, but I just wanted to touch on that. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about today uh, is the uh, recent satellite images and close up images we've seen of Russian aircraft with rubber tires on them. Uh, I put out a post after the uh, Ukrainian drone attack on uh, Piskov air, uh, airfield up in the north of the country. Uh, we still don't know where those drones come from. The Ukrainians said they launched them from inside Ukrainian ter- or Russian territory. I believe that they were launched either from Estonia or from somewhere, uh, uh, one of the Baltics, uh, and just right on the border. So there's plausible deniability about where these uh, drones came from. It'd be much easier to launch them from that territory than actually inside of Russia. But who knows? It doesn't change the fact of what happened. Uh, 
the uh, airfield was attacked and two IL-76s were destroyed. Uh, or one was completely destroyed and one was damaged, I believe. I think that was the extent. It could be more. I'm not sure. But I think it was just two. Um, and then after this event, we saw the Russian military putting rubber tires on the tops of their uh, planes, which everybody's laughing at. And I laughed at it, too, because I'm like, what, what is a rubber tire going to do? Build, spend the money, build the hangars, protect your aircraft. It's very simple. These drones are not doing an insane amount of damage. You're just talking about a very vulnerable vehicle with a very uh, cheap and expendable um, drone system uh, that are taking these out. So just build some cheap hangars. They're not expensive. You can do it. You're a huge industrial uh, country. It would take no time, but they seem to be moving very slow on that. And I don't know why. Um, but we see these tires on the backs of these vehicles. Uh, in particular, we've seen a close-up of a uh, SU-34 uh, with tires strapped all around it and uh, TU-95s and uh, TU-160s uh, with these tires on them. And at first, everybody was laughing. You know, there's the whole Cope Cage meme. Uh, but uh, Lord Bebo um, on Twitter and uh, Telegram actually uh, showed a satellite image uh, of these um, uh, vehicles. I'm going to put that picture up right here. Uh, these satellite photos show that the uh, visibility of these planes is greatly reduced by the addition of these tires uh, to satellites. So these satellites looking down, uh, spotting the uh, planes for you, the Ukrainian uh, for Ukrainian intelligence to take advantage of is greatly reduced. So uh, it may seem like some sort of cope. Uh, it might be some sort of cope. Uh, you know, it, it, I, don't, I don't think it's for the protection of the planes from an actual kinetic event, but for the protection of the planes so they're not as easily spotted and tracked at the airfields and can't be targeted as easily. Um, and I, I mean, that, that shows through these satellite photos, uh, rubber is really good at reducing a, the signature of a plane. So, um, that, that, that's what's going on there. And I think that that's very important to note. Um, but other than that, I, I think we're pretty much caught up. I'm going to do a couple more videos this weekend. Uh, I'm going to start saving stuff up because I, I just get real busy during the week. So, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to try to get these videos out more regularly. I really appreciate you guys sticking around. I'm sorry for the long delay between videos. I love doing them and uh, I appreciate you guys so much. If you want to subscribe to my Patreon, uh, the link will be in the description. Uh, my Twitter and Telegram links will also be in the description if you want to support me. And uh, if you guys wouldn't mind sharing this video around, get get the get the word out there because there's uh, important information that affects every one of us and it needs to be shared. All right. Uh, so take care, everybody, and have a good day.